Before we jump into part two in this study in the book of Ecclesiastes, a, a puzzling Old Testament wisdom book, perhaps a quick review of part one would be helpful. So here we go. Uh, Q, the main speaker, is a wisdom teacher. And he, as a wisdom teacher, he's trying to teach us how to live well in this world in light of the existence of God, how, how to do life right. And Q tells of his quest to find an answer to the big question, what do I get for all my efforts? Like, what can I do that will make all of this worth it, life worth it, the hard work worth it, the, the pain, the suffering, the struggle, all of that worth it? What, what can I do? What do I get? What's the prize at the end? And is it worth it? That's Q's quest. And Q uses reason and observation as the tools of his quest. So he experiments on himself. That's what we looked at in, in, in part one, the three phases of experimentation he did kind of on himself. Uh, he also uses careful studies of history, current events, life in general. He is a top-notch observer as well as a teacher. Let's pick up. In chapter 3, see what Q has to say to us today. There is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven. A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to avoid embracing. A time to search and a time to count as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time of peace. It's a poem. I, and as I was thinking about this poem that Q quotes for us, I don't know if he made it up or not, or if he's quoting one he got from somebody else. Uh, I'm not really great at poetry. I mean, I, I'm, I've made a few roses or red, violets or blue poems, but I'm not sure those count. But as I thought about this poem, I, I thought about the context in which I often hear it. I, I often see that this poem is chosen by seniors to be read at Baccalaureate. Why is that? I also notice that I use this poem frequently at funerals. Why is that? Well, I think it shows up in those two settings because we're being reminded as we're in those settings that everything has a time or a season. He kind of uses those words. You could use them interchangeably here. Right? Everything has a time or everything has a season. And we're now at a transition, right? If you're a baccalaureate, you're at a, a transition. You, you've been in school season for a very long time with these people, your friends and these teachers, and you've been living at home with your parents under their tutelage, right? And their guidance. And, and that season is coming to an end and you're at a transition point, an inflection point, And now it's time for something different. For many, it means going away, right? To join the military or go to college or, or something like that. So, and, and we're going to leave these people. We're going to leave home. We're at a transition. Uh, and because we're at a transition, we need to know that. Because if you don't realize you're at a transition, if you don't know what time it is now, you're liable to keep doing what you were doing in the last season, but that's not probably appropriate for the current season, the current time. Same thing with funerals. We're at a transition point. And right now is a time to mourn. I, I talk about that in funerals. We're going to have time today, I usually say, to do several things. To remember, to, to mourn, right? To celebrate to, and to hear God's perspective. This is a beautiful poem. And, and it's especially relevant, it seems, at two things. One, pointing out, hey, you're at a transition. But two, reminding us that Part of wisdom is knowing where you're at and what's appropriate now. Author Christopher Wright wrote a, a great commentary on uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. I've used it quite a bit in my personal study, and I'm going to quote him a couple times today. He said this, In the book of Proverbs, part of the wisdom of the wise lies in exactly this, knowing what is fitting and appropriate in any given circumstance or time. Quick time out. 
how, how many of us when we were younger, hopefully it was only when we were younger, but how, how many of us have gotten in trouble because we did something that was wholly inappropriate for the setting in which we were at? Like in other settings, you can do that, but not in this setting, right? You don't, there are certain things you don't do, for example, at a wedding or at a funeral or at a, you, you got the idea. Christopher says, the assumption is that God has ordered his creation in this way. There is a system and an order to life. Time is not just random or empty. It's part of God's creation. And time is part of the way God has given structure to our lives, both personally and socially. And time is one of the blessings and gifts of creation to us ever since the separation of night and day in Genesis 1. I think about that from time to time, like time is part of creation. This is my theory as to why God is timeless, right? Time is just one of the things God created for us, and he created it to help us personally. He created it to help us socially, as Christopher Wright pointed out. I think he created it to help us spiritually, so we could kind of keep track of where we are in the story of God. It's a fun thing to think about, the gift of created time. But Christopher says, you know, wise living means living in tune with God's created order, including created time. If you're going to be wise, you've got to be living in keeping with how God made things. So wisdom means knowing what time it is and how to act in that season. That's part of the message of the poem. Now, as you read the poem or you just heard me read it, you might think, whew, you know, that was good, Q. You know, thank you for sharing this poem. It, it, was, it, was, it was neat. It was insightful. It was well said. And it's nice to see that not everything you say is so depressing. It, we, we might think that. Well, let's see what Q has to say about the poem, because as expected, he has some commentary on it. This is chapter 3, verse 9. What does the worker gain from his struggles? I have seen the task that God has given the children of Adam to keep them occupied. He has made everything appropriate in his time. He's also put eternity in their hearts, but no one can discover the work God has done from beginning to end. Like, what? I mean, like immediately following the poem, this is what... He, what, what Q says, he's right back to the question, what does the worker gain from his struggles? Like, what, what's the point? What do I get? But it's as if Q is saying to you and to me, that's a nice poem, isn't it? I'm glad you liked it. But, but hear me on this, knowing that there's a, a right time for everything is nice. That's great. I'm glad you liked it. But it doesn't answer the question, does it? It doesn't answer the big question. What is the point of it all? What's the prize? What does the worker gain from all of his struggles? It doesn't answer it. So it's, it's a cute poem and it's helpful. But it doesn't solve my quest, Q says. And then second, did you catch in there? Q's referencing God. He says that God gave mankind the task uh, to keep them occupied, and God put eternity in their hearts, but you can't figure out what God has done from beginning to end. I think Q is saying to us, guys, it seems that God is part of the problem. Now, whoa, the, you know, if that like strikes you, you good, good. <laughs> that means you, you've come to the point where you think, you know, God is part of the solution, never part of the problem. But Q is wrestling here. You got to remember, right? Q is in, in on a quest and he's struggling in it. It, I think Q is saying, it, guys, it seems to me Q, God is part of the problem. He gave people the task of figuring all this out. And he put the desire to understand eternity in our hearts, but then he made it impossible for us to find the answer. Q is struggling. So wh where does Q go next? Well, Q moves from the angst that he's been expressing over the quest, the game we call catch the wind to a second source of pain and tension. This is chapter 3 verse 11. He's made everything that's God appropriate in its time. He's also put eternity in their hearts, but no one can discover the work God has done from beginning to end. And I know that there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and enjoy the good life, but it is also the gift of God whenever anyone eats, drinks, and enjoys all his efforts. I know that everything God does will last forever, and there's no adding to it or taking from it. God works so that people will be in awe of Him, and whatever is has already been done, and whatever will be already is. However, God seeks justice for the persecuted. And it kind of seems like 
there's some randomness to what Q is talking about here, but there's a thread, a repeated word. I know, I know, Q says. Q is moving into the next phase of his struggle, of, his, of the tension in his life, the reason for his angst. And the struggle starts with the things that Q knows by faith. He doesn't know them like for absolute certainty, but Q is an Old Testament Hebrew. He read the first five books or certainly has heard them taught. Perhaps he's taught them himself, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He knows about creation. He knows about Moses. He knows about the Exodus. He knows these stories. And so Q lists some things that he knows by faith, that God is in control of time. And what happens? That life is meant to be enjoyed, and that the ability to enjoy it is a gift from God. Life is good. It was given to us to be enjoyed. Q knows by faith that everything that God does lasts. What mankind does doesn't last, but what God does lasts. Q knows that God works in ways with a purpose that people will be in awe of him. And Q knows by faith that God cares about justice and he seeks justice for the persecuted. But that's not the end of the story. Verse 16, he continues, I also observed under the sun there is wickedness at the place of judgment, and there's wickedness at the place of righteousness. And I said to myself, God will judge the righteous and the wicked since there's a time for every activity and every work. Chapter 4, verse 1, again, I observed all the acts of oppression being done under the sun. Look at the tears of those who are oppressed. They have no one to comfort them. Power is with those who oppress them, and they have no one to comfort them. Q's like, uh, I, he's thinking through all the things he knows. He knows that God is going to do justice, but he, when he looks around, he's not seeing justice, right? The things that he knows about God, but they're not lining up well with what he's seeing when he looks at the news when he looks at his neighborhood, when he looks at his country, when he looks at the world, here's what Q says, sees. He listed a few of them for us. Q sees unchecked injustice at the place of justice. Like at the very place where justice ought to be happening, in court. There's bribery and corruption and he's like unchecked injustice. Q sees unchecked wickedness at the place of righteousness. This might be analogous to uh, like abuse in, in the church, right? At the very place where you expect to find righteousness at church or in his day in, at the temple. You find wickedness. You find anger and gossip and abuse and power hungry people, right? And he's like, this is not right. This It doesn't compute. And, and then third, he, Q sees unchecked oppression everywhere. And, and so he's struggling, right? Q says, here's what I know, right? Here's what I know. God is, and God cares, and God does. But the, here's what I see, and these are they, there's a gap. They're not lining up well. They're not matching, and he's feeling this tension. Uh, I said there's a gap between the two. It's like his faith is on a collision course with reality as he sees it. Like, how, how, can, how can God be all this and all that, and yet the world be like the way it is? His faith is on a collision course with reality as he sees it. And as we listen to him in the rest of what we'll read today and in the next couple of weeks, it's not obvious whether or not his faith is going to survive this collision. Before... Um, I did much else study for this series. I just, I just read the whole book of Ecclesiastes, uh, all 12 chapters, uh, several times. And this section that we're in right now just really stuck out to me as like being like kind of the heart of where Q is at, where his faith is colliding with reality as he sees it. Hence the title of this series is When, when Faith and Harsh Reality Collide. And I, and I asked Mara to put together, you know, get, can you give me a picture of two freight trains just <laughs> heading at each other? Because this is what you know. Trains have a lot of momentum and when they hit, boom. I mean, it is a 
bigger than life wreck. And that's what it feels like is going to happen to Q. He is a man of faith. There are things he knows about God by faith. He's not seen God, but he knows these things because he believes what he's been taught about God. And that is a train, and it's a great train, and, and is barreling down the track and meant to carry his life along. He's a wisdom teacher, and as a wisdom teacher, he's teaching people how to live in light of the existence of God and what God is really like. That train is barreling at full speed. At the same time, he's a, he's a social scientist. Q is an observer, and he's looking at the world, and he's looking at the news, and he's looking, like I said, at his country and his neighborhood, and he sees things that don't match at all, and that's like another train, the harsh realities uh, of life, and that train is barreling at him, and, it, and it's going to collide with his faith, and who knows what's going to happen. I commend for admitting that there's a tension between what we know and what we see. And it, it's not just Q. Um, this, I want to give you a few examples of know and see collisions that Christians are struggling with today. This week I happened to be able to be in a Zoom call with Steve Cuss, and he listed three of these things. He called them expectation gaps, I, I, but they're no and see collisions, the, the gap between, or the conflict between what I know by faith, what my faith tells me, and what I'm seeing. Here's the, the first one Steve mentioned is, God loves me, but I don't feel it, right? For some reason, I, I, I'm not feeling that. That's the harsh reality is I'm not feeling God's love, but I know by faith that God loves me. And these two, so th their intention, and sometimes it's not intention, it's more like a train wreck, right? A second one Steve mentioned is God is with me, but I don't see it. Like I, I, I know by faith that God is with me, but I don't, I don't see it. I feel like I am on my own in this thing and I'm drowning, right? These circumstances are just overpowering me. God is with me, yes, but the harsh reality is I'm not seeing God's intervention. I've read the Bible. I've read the stories about miracles, but I have not seen one. I've read about God showing up or sending an angel, but I have not seen one. Oh, instead, I just see this horrible situation that I'm in, a no-win situation with no out. A third one that Steve mentioned was this. I thought I'd be further along by now. I thought I'd be further along by now. I, the tension here is I know by faith that the Holy Spirit is active. And that sanctification is a real thing, like God is turning me into someone who looks more and more like Jesus. I know that by faith, and yet I'm still struggling with, this This is the harsh reality, I am still struggling with the same sins I was struggling with three years ago, and probably five years ago. Like, I, I really thought, like, it would get easier by now, or I would obey more naturally, or I wouldn't still be, or I would be over this thing or that thing. And, and there's a gap between, between what I know by faith and what I, about God and how God works in the world and how He works in me and what I'm seeing in my ability to be godly. I'm still struggling like I was, or I just thought I'd be further along by now. Those are three that Steve gave. I, it reminded me uh, of, of a different one that I've been wrestling with. I've been in a conversation with God now for a few weeks. Okay, that's not true. I've actually been in a monologue with God for a few weeks. Like I've been doing all the talking, and 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 uh, he hasn't been doing a whole lot of talking on this. And my conversation conversation with God has kind of gone along these lines. Uh, God, I would protect people more than you do. Like I see somebody struggling or they're going through something, and I think like if it was within my power, I wouldn't. I, I would give them. A pass on that or I would make life a little easier for them or I would give them a break or I would help them more or I wouldn't have put all that on their plate at the same time and and, and I was coming to this conclusion like God doesn't seem to think like he needs to shield his servants as much as I want to shield and protect them there's a gap 
between what I know about the goodness of God and the gentle shepherd of Psalm 23 and, and the, the loving Father that He is and that Jesus taught us to pray to and the struggle that I see. And it's easy for me to falsely conclude that, God, something's not right here. Like, like, like you should be doing this differently. You should be more protective or shield your people more than you do. I'm just trying to be honest with you, like Q is. He's letting us know, guys, I'm struggling with this. There's a gap between what I know and what I see, and I'm struggling with that tension. I commend Q as well for, for not being numb to the unpleasant seasons of life, He's not numb to the suffering. He's not numb to the injustice, the oppression in the world. He's not numb to any of that. He sees it and sits in it long enough to feel it. It's not just a world that baffles our understanding. It's also a world that we cannot bear to look at for long. Yeah, isn't that true? And Q hasn't turned his gaze away quickly, has he? He's not numb. He hasn't tried to distract himself. He's looked at that and he's like, man, God, this is so awful. I can't stand it. How can you stand it? And God, if you, because you can't stand it, like why why isn't something happening? Which leads to the next big idea. Q's faith makes this collision much more painful because by faith he knows that things should be better. Right? He knows about the Garden of Eden. He, yes, does Q know about the fall? But yes, he, he does. But he knows that things could be better and they could be different. He knows that God is capable of making it all better. But God hasn't. And so that faith that Q has... Like it is making this more difficult. Like if there was no God, if evolution was the final word on like how our world came into being, well, okay, then maybe that would make sense. But Q doesn't believe that. Q believes our world was created good by a good creator. And if God is good and generous and powerful and just, how can the world be bad and scarce and oppressive and seemingly so random, the the fact that he believes and he knows what God is like is making this collision so much worse because it's like, God, there's no reason for this all. There's no reason for it to be like that. Now, be, you know things Q doesn't know, right? You, you have the New Testament. You've read more of the story, right? And so don't, don't be too quick to jump on Q. Know those things that you know, please. <laughs> Hang on to them. But just follow Q and, and l- let his angst be something that sinks in a little bit. Let's see where he goes next. Verse 18, I said to myself, this happens so that God may test the children of Adam and that they may see for themselves that they're, they're like animals. For the fate of the children of Adam and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. People have no advantage over animals since everything is futile. All are going to the same place. All come from dust. All return to dust. And who knows if the spirits of the children of Adam go upward and the spirits of animals go downward to the earth. It appears Q doesn't know about the afterlife. He's like, who knows? Maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's different. I, he doesn't know with any certainty about the afterlife. And, and he, doesn't, he certainly doesn't know about Jesus, and, right? And he, he doesn't know any of that. And Q's ignorance and his pain lead him to some conclusions, two of them. First, enjoy life while you're alive. Verse 22, I have seen there's nothing better than for a person to enjoy his activities because that is his reward. For who can enable him to see what will happen after he dies? He's like, listen, while you're alive, you can enjoy life, so do it. You don't know what happens afterwards. At least Q doesn't. So he's like, listen, enjoy life while you can, while you're alive, because who knows what comes after death. And second, Q advises, throws out this thought, I guess, it might be better to have never existed. And that sounds like, whoa, harsh. But it's actually very similar to what Job said in Job 3, verses 3 to 5, and what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 20, 18. Let's hear it from Q's mouth. 
So I commended the dead who have already died, more than the living at least, who, who are still alive. But better than either of them is the one who has not yet existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. It's almost like you could see Q. He's off the side and he's just... He's like, he's like he's breathing heavily, silently sobbing as he looks at this world and he looks at the cognitive dissonance that's going on in his head, the tension that's there, and he looks at the world and he looks at the oppression and he sees person after person who has no one to help them and he knows that he can't fix it all, and, right? And, and he's just, he just, he just overcome with all of it and he's thinking like, man, the, the, the dead are better off because at least they don't have that in their future. Future, and maybe better than, than either of them is a person who's never existed because they, they've never had to even see it, let alone overcome it or live or try to survive it. Uh, wow. Takeaways as we wrap this up. Two of them. One, you, you might want to hold off on adopting Q's conclusions. He's on a quest. Let's go with him on the quest. Let's see where this lands. Let's hold off on adopting the conclusions that he's come to so far. He's not to the end, okay? But second, you might want to list your own no and see tensions. Like, I gave you an example of one of mine and three that Steve Cuss had brought up. Where, where do you feel the tension between what you know, right, by faith? God, you are, and you do, and you see, and you, right? What, versus... What, what you either you're experiencing yourself or you're seeing in the world around you. Where, where's the tension for you? You might want to list those, know and see tensions, because this quest might help you as you work through that and perhaps as faith, your faith, and the harsh realities of your life someday or perhaps even in the present collide. We'll pick up here in part three.